Next, we're pleased to be joined by Michael Schwartz. Michael is a professor of sociology at Stony Brook University. Professor Schwartz analyzes the U.S. occupation of Iraq for such websites as Tom Dispatch and Huffington Post. His book, War Without End, published next year by Haymarket Books, will be out at the end of the year. This year. <laughs> Thank you. Now, let me begin by saying that I am honored to be invited to speak here today at this uh, momentous, momentous meeting and humbled, and humbled by the speeches I've heard so far earlier in the day of the people who have actually served in Iraq and Afghanistan and have had to witness and experience the horror of these wars close up. Uh, I want to talk about something that is a mystery for a lot of people, but maybe not for those of you who are here, which is the tenaciousness with which the United States is insisting on remaining both in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, a kind of tenaciousness that um, surprises a lot of people because it would appear, for example, in Afghanistan that the mission was accomplished long ago and only began to slip away after the United States remained. And in Iraq, as the mission constantly changes and the only thing that seems to be constant is the commitment without a real, uh, at least public accounting of why the United States is there. Um, and I think as we've heard from several of our speakers, we can tell that this tenaciousness is going to extend well into 2009, 2010, because all of the candidates for the presidency seem to endorse the idea that the United States must remain and be powerful in the Middle East. I just want to read two brief quotes, one from Clinton and one from Obama, which I think will add to what we've already heard about their positions by pointing to a couple of the key ideas that I want to talk about today. This is from uh, Hillary Clinton's interview last uh, fall with the New York Times, a very long and elaborate interview uh, in which uh, she made the following comment about her commitment to remaining in Iraq. I think we have remaining vital national security interests in Iraq, and I've spoken about that on many different occasions. I think it really does matter whether you have a failed province or a region that serves as a petri dish for insurgents and al-Qaeda. It is right in the heart of the oil region. It is directly in opposition to our interests, to the interests of regimes, to Israel's interests. So I think we have a remaining military as well as political mission trying to contain the uh, extremists. This from Obama. We must turn our focus to those concrete objectives in the Middle East that are possible to attain, namely preventing Iraq from becoming what Afghanistan once was, maintaining our influence in the Middle East. Now, this, uh, just, just to reiterate a couple of things. From her we get remaining military as well as political mission in the heart of the oil region, from Obama, maintaining our influence in the Middle East. Uh, we have to unpack these, these, these pieces of code. These are not just fluff. This is, this is the stuff they really are talking about here. What does this mean, maintaining our influence in the Middle East? And it's this kind of sense that we have to have this powerful presence there. This isn't just a matter of we have to accomplish a mission and go away. We have to have a powerful presence there. And I want to talk about what they see as this powerful presence. It's this powerful presence that leads them to a policy of pacification, the kind of policy we've been hearing about all day that leads them to order our troops to perform a version of state terrorism on the people in Iraq and Afghanistan in an attempt to fully pacify them so that the country will be pacific, right? Willing to accept this massive influence that our leaders are talking about establishing, sustaining, and maintaining. And in, of course, in the, case of, uh, in, the, in the case of McCain, you know, he's willing to put the 100 years on it, you know, uh, so we know how long a, a kind of sense they have of this. Now, at a risk of being, uh, you know, of being irreverent, I think a good way to summarize what the reason is, is you might just say it's the oil, stupid, you know. Uh, and I want to talk about the history of the United States and oil in the Middle East, 
with an eye towards why this has become such a focal point in uh, American foreign policy, and by the way, American domestic policy, by the way, American economic policy, are all tied together in this. We have to see this, and of course, the whole question of global warming and all these other attached issues are all part of this. Now, you can go back as far as you want. As soon as oil became important, everybody understood that the Middle East was going to be important. Here's just a couple of quotes from the end of World War II. This is from the British officials who, of course, were the leaders of the pack up to World War II. Uh, from them, Middle Eastern oil, quote, a vital prize for any power interested in world influence or domination. Notice there's a big power aspect in this. They're not just saying we need it economically. We need it for political influence. Same time, U.S. officials, a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. One greatest material prizes in world history. And notice that word stupendous. You know, the Americans are always more exuberant than the Brits. The Brits like to be understated, right? Vital prize. The Americans like to be overstated. Stupendous source. Fast forward 25 years. Uh, 25 years that, by the way, are marked with numerous American interventions in these countries, all of them involving oil, right? The overthrow of the Iranian government in 1953, oil's involved. The uh, 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 the hel helping the Ba'athists take power and eliminate the left in Iraq, oil was involved. They thought the oil might head, head on over towards the Soviet Union rather than the American side. Then, of course, they experienced a multiple, multiple disasters in the 1970s, including two really important ones in the Middle East, uh, one of them being the development of OPEC, which now threatens for the Middle Eastern oil, oil countries to actually wield an independent power in the, in the world, and they exercise it uh, quite dramatically in the 1970s, and then the overthrow of the Shah of Iran in 1979. Now, you know, we are accustomed in our country to think of uh, uh, the Republicans as the ones who are belligerent, but in 1979, President Jimmy Carter, this is before his Habitat for Humanity days, this is while he was still president, enunciated what became known as the Carter Doctrine, that the Persian Gulf oil was his word, quote, vital, unquote, to American national interests, not just the economy, and that the U.S. would, quote, use any means necessary, including military force, to sustain access to it. To assure this access, he announced the creation of the Rapid Deployment Joint Task Force, now called Centron, CENTCOM, right? It's the group that now is running the war in Iraq that would allow the United States to deliver large numbers of personnel from all services together with state-of-the-art military equipment to any location in the Middle East. Now, of course, uh, Ronald Reagan advanced and, and, and uh, continued this policy. And then in 1990, another momentous moment arose is when the Soviet Union collapsed, right? And this caught the attention of all the policymakers in Washington. It was designated by a Washington Post columnist the unipolar moment. This unipolar moment was the moment when the United States was suddenly the preeminent military power in the world. So preeminent that even in those days, we, were, we spent more money than the next 15 countries combined militarily. Now we spend more money than the rest of the world combined militarily. So we are the preeminent military power. And there erupted a debate in Washington, uh, especially after the Gulf War, right, about how to preserve this unipolar moment and what ways to use our military, our military preeminence, in order to manage world affairs to the advantage of the leadership of the American government. Now, by 1998, uh, you know, one of the great moments is when the Bush administration is defeated and Carter and, and Clinton comes into office. Of course, a lot of us thought, well, this is going to make a big change in policy, and unfortunately it didn't, right? But one of the things it did do, it took all these policymakers from the Bush administration out of government. And so they spent a lot of their time writing down what they would do if they had the government. So unlike most governments, when Bush II took office, there was a written record of what they were thinking, why they were thinking it, and how they were going to go about it. And one of the most noteworthy parts of this is the Project for a New American Century, established by all familiar, fam figures, many of whom, uh, 15, 20, or 30 of whom actually had high offices in the uh, Clinton, in the uh, Bush II administration. And um, at one point in 1998, they wrote a letter to President Clinton urging him to 
quote, turn your administration's attention to implementing a strategy for removing Saddam's regime from power. They cited both the military's dictator of mil military belligerence and his control over, quote, a significant portion of the world's supply of oil. Two years later, the group issued a ringing policy statement that would be the guiding text for the new administration, entitled Rebuilding America's Defenses and Advocating What Would Become Known as Rumsfeldian Transformation of the Pentagon. It advocated that the U.S. military preeminence be utilized to, quote, secure and expand American influence in the world, including in cases of North Korea and Iraq, its possible use, quote, to remove these regions from power and conduct and conduct post-stability operations. The document even commented on the probability of overwhelming resistance in the United States to such an aggressive use of the military for offensive wars, noting ominously that public approval could not be obtained without, and this is their statement, quote, some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor, which of course they got at 9-11. In the meantime, a crisis is really brewing here, and this is the oil situation in the world. In 1991, because of the Gulf, first Gulf War, both Kuwaiti and Iraqi oil was temporarily taken off the market. That was four million barrels per day taken off the market. Now in the past, the way this had always been handled was is that the Saudis would simply increase their production they were running between 50 and 70 percent, and boom, they would just cover the difference. The Saudis were unable to cover the dis uh, distance, according to them, though some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, neocons thought that maybe they were doing it deliberately. But in any case, this triggered a recession, and the recession, ironically, is why Bush lost re-election in 1992. So he fought a war that was supposed to guarantee him re-election, but the war itself caused the recession that defeated him, right? Just one of these ironies of history, and it does seem like the second Bush administration seems to have gotten itself into a similar tangle. Now, what happens going on into the, into the 1990s, right, is that we find out from that that the s space between the amount of oil being pumped in the world and the amount of oil being needed in the world is getting narrower and narrower, and it gets really bad during the 90s. In 1998 is the year when the United States reached the 50 percent point and now we import more than 50 percent of our oil. So we became a dependent country at that point. And peak oil has loomed. Peak oil is the moment when the amount of oil they're discovering and putting online is less than the amount of oil that's coming offline because we're draining the existing reserves. Right? And it turns out that peak oil isn't really even the critical thing. The critical thing is when supply passes demand. But su supply is below demand. This is Alan Greenspan, our eminent uh, economic guru, stating uh, in the 1990s, the buffer between supply and demand of oil has narrowed to the point where OPEC is unable to absorb without price consequences shutdowns of even a small part of the world's production. So here we are in the 90s and this crisis is brewing. And then what happens, of course, is that um, you have the following. You have Iran, Iraq, and Venezuela by the late 1990s are in the hands of political opponents of the American administration. And they see this as a tremendous threat. And these guys are very independent of American economic policy. And they are unwilling, for example, to do things to lower the price of oil when the United States needs for that to happen. They are unwilling, for example, to increase production when it suits the United States but not them. And it looks like OPEC is going to become increasingly independent or even beyond that, that Saudi Arabia itself would maintain a, uh, uh, an independent policy. At this moment, the Bush administration enters. And you know, it's, it's a lost part of those of us, it's lost to those of us who focus on the war in Iraq, but one of the really big things that happened right away in the Bush administration was the Cheney Energy Commission, which of course all its deliberations were secret. And I know that the way I thought about it at that time was, oh, they were secret because, you know, they were in bed with the uh, energy companies and they didn't want us to know it, right? But there was something far more ominous going on there and far more consequential. I mean, they understood that they had a looming crisis, that